with that, I'll hand over to Christine for the flavor session. Great, thanks, Marco. Uh, welcome everybody to this afternoon's session on flavor physics. So our first talk is uh, Lucia Grillo. Do you want to share your slides, Lucia? And she'll be talking about B anomalies, semi-leptonic and rare B decays, experimental summary. Yes, hello, can you see my slides? Yes, that looks fine. Okay, yeah, so uh, I will get going. So let's start with what uh, I have been including in this talk. So this uh, is a collection of recent experimental results of uh, measurements using um, heavy hadron decays into a pair of leptons and a lighter hadron. Uh, and they uh, happen to be uh, mostly from two dedicated flavor physics experiments, but there are also experimental results from other experiments. And uh, please also do check the um, summary from Christina tomorrow about rare decays and all the relevant uh, parallel talks I will point you to. So uh, we said uh, heavy hadron decaying into a lighter hadron and a lepton pair. So these transitions are of uh, two types in the standard model. So uh, we will be talking about flavor change in neutral currents, which uh, uh, happen through loop diagrams in the standard model. And these are uh, referred to as rare decays. Um, they are rare, but on the other hand, they are experimentally convenient because you don't have neutrinos in the final state, for example, and this makes your reconstruction and analysis easier. The other type of uh, decays we will be looking at are for the change in charge currents, so uh, happening in the southern model at three levels through uh, a W boson exchange, and I will refer to these at sem as semi-leptonic decays. So, um, uh, experimentally, they are fantastic because the, the branching fractions are really high. On the other hand, they do have uh, challenges because uh, of uh, the neutrino or neutrinos in the final state, which can make your reconstruction and analysis harder. So in both cases, we can have observables with very clean and precise standard model predictions. Of course, depends on the observable. And uh, it, it would be, in some cases, it would be very nice um, to have, it would be very beneficial to have improvement from hadronic form factors improvements. So um, in both cases, we can describe the case with uh, an effective theory, uh, meaning an effective Hamiltonian, uh, uh, which is uh, the sum of uh, Wilson coefficients times the relevant operators. And these Wilson coefficients uh, uh, are uh, standard model, but we can also look for new physics components, these coefficients. So what are the dominant standard model contributions? In the case of semi-electronic decays, it's uh, e easily said uh, left-handed vector because of the W boson exchange. In the case of uh, the rare decays, you have a vector and axial vector contributions, which we will uh, refer to as C9 and C10 later on. And there's also the contribution to the, di uh, to the di pho photon dipole uh, C7. So uh, the order I will go, uh, showing you a few uh, most recent results, is in increasing uh, order of Santa Monde precision, which also corresponds a bit in uh, uh, complexity of the measurements. So just a reminder about uh, um, the Q square spectrum for these B2 SLL uh, decays. So uh, you see it's in general sensitive to these whistle coefficients that we've mentioned, exception made for the um, for the resonance uh, regions, which however can be used for experimentally as we will see. So um, starting from branch infractions, you probably do remember uh, that uh, uh, for these measurements, uh, a branch fraction uh, as a function of Q squared, the experimental data uh, undershoots the standard model predictions. But in this case, we need to remember that the uh, theory uncertainties are sizable because of uh, hadronic effects and, they are, uh, and the, the uncertainties are also correlated. Uh, so, yeah, we need to keep this in mind when interpreting the results. However, I still want to show you uh, one of our latest from LACB, uh, that is the branch infection of BS to 5 mu decays, and you can see uh, the discrepancy uh, with uh, the standard model based on uh, which uh, 
um, hadronic description you choose. So uh, moving one step towards more precise uh, uh, predictions for the observables, we need to go to uh, angular analysis of these B2SLL decays. So uh, we can describe these decays uh, with uh, the four dimensional decay rate as function of Q square and angles in the um, decay. And uh, there are a number of measurements here. It, you can just uh, see the references to few recent uh, LACB results. There are a few, um, uh, I, I will make a choice uh, in what I show you. So the, uh, the idea is to measure angular observables in uh, Q square beams. So for example, here you find the, um, per, the projection of the fit in the angles uh, for one of the Q square beams of B0 to K0 mu mu decays. Uh, you can use this angle to build your uh, angular observable. And when you use uh, all the Q square beams, you find something like this, if the observable is a forward backward symmetry as, as function of Q squared. So which observables is worth using? Uh, of course, the best is to use the set of observables that uh, minimizes the adronic uncertainties. And this is where P, uh, P5 prime comes into the game. And uh, uh, here I'm showing you um, uh, our latest uh, LACB results using B0 to K star 0 mu mu, B plus to K star plus mu mu, and I don't show BS to phi mu mu, but it's also a very recent result. So, of course, your question is uh, uh, what is the agreement between these results and the standard model? And um, in order to do this, this is a number of uh, uh, global fits to these and other results. So, the significance is uh, in terms of uh, relevant Wilson coefficients that we quote in our papers are these, so from two to uh, a little over three sigmas um, in the different measurements. So uh, I think it's fair to say that the theory and uncertainty are, are under scrutiny, and I hope we can discuss this with the next talk. So uh, not only LACB and uh, Bell, of course, contribute to this game, um, Atlas and CMS can also be competitive players. And here you see the AP5 prime uh, plot, which includes contributions from uh, CMS and Atlas. And I was also delighted to learn that uh, um, there is a number of ongoing analysis and a few published analysis using also complementary uh, decay modes. So one more question you might have is, uh, can we do a similar analysis with charm decays? And the answer is yes. And uh, I won't unfortunately have the time to tell you anything about it, but you should really follow Dominic Stoke uh, presenting angular analysis of D0 to HH mu mu decays. So uh, I think now we can move to um, uh, left universality ratios. So, uh, as you know, in the standard model, um, the uh, uh, interaction with uh, charged leptons is expected to be exactly the same, uh, except exception made for mass uh, driven, difference mass of masses uh, driven effects. So the ratio of branch infraction of the same decays, including muons and electrons in the final state is very close to one and very precisely known. So uh, basically the challenge here is on experimental side because uh, it depends on whether uh, the detection and reconstruction of your leptons is the same uh, or of the same quality in your detector. So for example, in LACB, there is a, a noticeable difference between electrons and muons um, being the uh, electrons detected fewer than the muons and also with a worse resolution because of uh, the bram strahlung effect. There is, of course, a, a bram strahlung recovery used, but uh, uh, this doesn't, uh, doesn't recover fully your resolution. You just need to model it. So the, the, this problem is not there basically for Bell. Uh, as you know, it's an aromatic detector using E plus minus um, collisions with the initial uh, state known. And these uh, um, uh, electromagnetic calorimeters, which covers the full solid angle and has pointing properties, really helps when you want to compare electrons and muons. So if you look at uh, um, 
plots for electrons and muons in a, a variable equivalent to the invariant mass. And these are plots that they have taken uh, from our K star uh, measurement at Bell. So using B plus to K star plus LL and nice spin partner. So if you compare the plots for uh, muons and electrons, you, you notice two things. First of all, that the number of decays with muons and electrons don't differ too much. And second, you don't see a, a huge resolution difference and background difference. So um, this analysis in perfor is performed in uh, high and low Q square bin and, and, and is uh, consistent with the standard model, but is still statistically limited. So here, um, uh, improvement is expected using a wider Q square range, but especially moving to bad two uh, data sets. And uh, uh, yeah, you should see uh, also additional measurements performed by Bell in the parallel session. So if you look at analogous plots from LACB, so comparing the environment mass in the case of uh, uh, B plus to K plus mu mu and B plus to K plus EE, you see that the picture is quite different. You have about a third of the events in the muons and also backgrounds and uh, resolution look quite different. However, we do have an experimental strategy that helps um, against the differences between the two charged leptons and is to use a double ratio. And here is where the region in the uh, resonances of the Q square spectrum become useful because you can uh, not only normalize the number of uh, decays uh, you find with the efficiency, which is something that you should do anyways, but um, every yield is in fact normalized by the yield uh, in the resonance region. Also, you can use the ratio of yields of electrons muons in the resonance region as a standard candle to make sure that your analysis doesn't have any biases. So, um, okay, this is, these are how our plots for um, RK uh, and uh, I just wanted to quickly show you the uh, same plots for the isospin pattern analysis that is very recent. So putting everything a bit on the table, uh, it, here are also measurements I had absolutely no chance to mention, uh, but you see quite a few tensions here and there, but what is your real question is about the combination of these results in particular, you would be interested in combining all the uh, observables and decay modes. And this is uh, a nice present we got at uh, the last flavor anomaly workshop. But here you see uh, the combination of the different results uh, fitting directly in um, effective field theory coefficients. So uh, here you see plus C9 new physics, uh, C, C10 uh, new physics versus C9 uh, new physics in case you only use uh, left universality ratios and the BS mu mu, and in case you include also the other observables we have spoken about. So there has been also another attempt to estimate the global uh, the significance of the uh, results we see. And this is by fitting all the Wilson coefficients together in order to avoid the calcium effects. And this is uh, slightly above four sigma uh, tension between the experimental results and the um, standard model. And you should look at David's poster for more details about this work. Of course, we are looking forward for other experiments to confirm uh, or not these results. And uh, Bell 2 is uh, uh, uniquely placed for this already with the five inver inverse Alcaban sample. And indeed, Bell 2 already started uh, with uh, physics papers and this, uh, which is the first, uh, is a complementary probe and is a search of B plus uh, to K plus uh, new new bar. And uh, I found very interesting that uh, you, the limit they put is already competitive with the first 63 in Berthland of one they got. And uh, that's, uh, that's it for our decays. Let me move to semi leptonic decays and follow a similar uh, pattern starting from um, branching 
fractions. So in this case, branching fractions are uh, sensitive to CKM matrix elements and uh, hadronic form factors. Let me uh, speak a little bit about VUB because it's something that we recently measured uh, in a couple of decay modes. So uh, the, the golden mode to measure VUB is of course B0 to pi mu nu and uh, uh, Bell and Babar made very precise measurements about um, this branch infraction, you, here you see the combination and you see the impact on the VUB versus VCB HFLAV uh, um, combination. Uh, two quite recent uh, uh, addition to this plot have been uh, made by LACB using Lambda B and BS decays. And uh, I'm just going to say a few words about the measurement using this VS decays. So this is a measurement of the ratio of VUB over VCB um, using uh, BS2K mu nu decays and the BS2S mu nu decays. So experimentally, all you need is your number of events and the precise determination of the efficiencies. However, the number of events can be tricky to um, measure in case of a partially reconstructed decay mode. In this case, we don't reconstruct the neutrino, so we need to use a strategy to reconstruct the uh, missing momentum. And uh, we need to use uh, variables um, that can account for this missing momentum. Here, for example, we use a corrected mass that is an invariant mass corrected by uh, the perpendicular component to the flight the uh, direction of the B um, of the missing momentum. So uh, the full analysis is performing two Q-square bins. And this is because uh, to get a view over VCB, you do need um, the theory input, and we have two different inputs for the two Q square regions. So, like with some rooms for, for the low Q square region and uh, lattice QCD for the high um, Q square bin. So, uh, the, these are the, the, the two results how you can visualize it on the same view over VCB uh, plot. The take home message for experimentalists is it would be nice to have a differential measurement. Uh, for lattice, it would be nice to have lattice over the full Q square range if possible. So we can also use these uh, BS to uh, DS mini decays to measure VCB. And uh, this measurement I am uh, quickly speaking about is a, a measurement of the rate relative to B0 to D mini decays. It does need external inputs to um, extract VCB and the copes with the unconstrained kinematics by using a proxy variable. So these uh, perpendicular momentum of the DS with respect to the flight direction. Um, it uses two uh, form factors parameterizations and shows uh, results pretty consistent uh, and competitive if you look at the global picture. So we had a, um, a, a complementary measurement using completely different technique. And uh, besides showing the good agreement between the two measurements, this was uh, a measurement of the shape of the differential decay rate. I hope both these analyses uh, lay down the basis for uh, more fully differential measurements of these decays by LSP. So uh, talking about VB, VCB area, of course, uh, Bell will re get the lead in precision uh, with five inverse out of one, but even with one inverse out of one for the, for the bit pi decay, for example. So uh, let's universality test, let's go back to that. And let's go back to the electron mu universality. So if you wanna test electron mu universality with something completely um, complementary to the B2 SLL transition, you want to use semi electronic decays, Semi-leptonic decays of charm hadron, charm mesons is what you want to do. And this is what PES3 uh, is doing. And here uh, I just report a measurement of um, uh, the uh, ratio of branch infraction for D0 to K mu nu and D0 to K E nu decays uh, that is measured integrated and differentially Q squared and uh, uh, it is a very precise uh, uh, measurement uh, so far. Uh, it's not the only though, because there is a number of more recent results uh, of which I only show you the uh, first observation of D0 to rho mu nu decays with the relative um, lepton universality ratio. So I think we are ready to move to 
the uh, lactose universality ratios using um, tau decays. So in this case, our H is the ratio of branch infraction of uh, um, uh, decays, including uh, inclu which include the tau in the final state with respect to uh, the same decays, including light leptons, uh, which means which means muons so far for LACB. So you all know these. Uh, um, uh, are, are the star versus are the plot? You know that the, the uh, experimental average is uh, in about three sigma tension with some model prediction, and you also know that the most recent addition to this plot is uh, the ellipse from Bell using semi leptonic tag and leptonic tau decays. Lucia, you have five minutes left. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so the key point of this measurement is to um reconstruct uh, the charm uh, meson and uh, light lepton and use the kinematic variables and uh, Monte Carlo and data driven techniques to describe the composition of these samples as best as you can. So these measurements for RD are uh, still statistically limited, especially if you look at RD, so new measurements are needed uh, and uh, um, very uh, high precision measurements are expected from Bell already with five in this to barn. It should be uh, uh, quite more precise be, uh, than the uh, current Bell to best measurement, uh, Bell best measurement. So at LACB, we can do two things with tau. We can either follow a similar strategy using the mnemonic decay of the tau, uh, also extracting directly uh, the RH ratio with different systematics and backgrounds, or we could use uh, the uh, hadronic tau decay to free charge pi on neutrino and possibly a, uh, a neutral uh, pi. On. So this is the advantage of uh, reconstructing the tau decay uh, vertex. And that's the disadvantage that, however, you need an external input to convert your ratio to an R. H ratio. So the first approach is used for uh, RD star and R uh, J psi so far, and the second is used for RD star. And from today, you learn that this is also used for our first R lambda C measurement. So this is a new measurement uh, for this conference. is literally part of the press, and the, you will see the uh, talk by Guy tomorrow with more details, and it should be available on CDS exactly as we speak. So this uh, measurement is really important because it uses um, baryonic decays. So uh, the decay when we use is lambda B to lambda C tau nu. And these decays have a different spin structure. So it's uh, really important to probe also this system. Still, uh, also in this case, we have standard, we, we have precise standard model predictions, so it's a very interesting measurement to perform. So uh, we use um, hadronic decays of the taus, which means that we can reconstruct the decay vertex of, of the tau, and this uh, can be used to suppress the background coming from um, decays, including three pions coming from the lambda B decays. So uh, there is uh, uh, another background that is potentially uh, problematic for this measurement, which is coming from lambda B to lambda C and another charm uh, uh, meson. And this is normally known as double charm, at least for us. And uh, uh, this component is carefully modeled accounting for the free by structure um, of, of the decay. So um, I, I, I said you have two minutes. Yes, thank you. So this, um, this, this background is potentially uh, dangerous, but thanks to a multivariate classifier, we can discriminate between signal decays that you see here in red and uh, uh, this double charm background here in orange, blue and uh, and uh, uh, purple as well, quite well. So the final number of uh, uh, signal candidates is uh, extracted by means of a fit to the tau decay time, uh, this uh, uh, multivariate classifier output and Q square. And um, with these uh, about 300 uh, events that we find, this is the first observation of this decay. 
So using an, as external input uh, the, the muonic branching fraction uh, measured by Delphi, we can uh, obtain the first R lambda C uh, ratio, which is 0.242, and uh, th these uncertainties uh, uh, statistical, uh, systematic, and uh, externally put it in order. So um, you need to compare this with standard model prediction. And when you do that, you find out that this result is compatible with the standard model, uh, is one sigma below the standard model prediction. So if you compare this with the other left universality um, ratios that we have measured with some mutant decays, you see that the other experimental results are all above the standard model prediction, while this uh, result is below. This is actually quite interesting because there is a number of new physics model which can accommodate uh, lower or higher uh, R lambda C uh, values, even given the current uh, experimental averages for R star and uh, R J psi. And I leave any other detail to give the uh, talk tomorrow. So uh, yeah, I hope I managed to uh, uh, show you which hints we are um, uh, having at the moment of Latin universality breaking in from a rec a recent measurements or combinations or global fits. And uh, yeah, uh, the take home message is that, that we need to look forward for new measurements with new data sets, experiments, uh, observables, and techniques. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Lucia, uh, for that uh, very comprehensive talk. Um, people should raise their hands if they have questions. Um, I'm just going to start with, with one, which is partly a comment, um, because you talked about lattice QCD at a couple of places. I just wanted to point out that uh, you mentioned a VCS determination from best results using uh, D to K, semi-leptonic decay. Um, HPQCD, the lattice collaboration HPQCD, have given a much uh, tighter um, value for VCS recently based on uh, a full analysis, a very accurate analysis of um, the form factors for D to K from Lattice QCD. And Will Parrott will be talking about that on Wednesday morning at uh, 9.20, for people who are interested. That's an example of what you can do with Lattice QCD if you have accurate form factors covering the full Q squared range, as we are getting now uh, for B decays. So for example, the BS to DS semi-leptonic decay you talked about uses HPQCD's full form factors across the full Q squared range. So my question to you then is, uh, and you sort of mentioned this in your talk, from a lattice QCD perspective, we would really like to have differential rates um, from LHCB so that we can compare to our form factors um, directly across the full Q squared range. What, what are the prospects for that? Do you... Yes, so indeed, yeah, uh, we, we are aware. So uh, there are a number of uh, uh, measurements ongoing that are aiming to provide the differential uh, branch interaction. So uh, for what I have uh, uh, spoken about, so for the VUB measurement, uh, in this case, the prospect is to uh, measure, uh, to provide the differential measurement. And uh, I think in general, uh, also um, for uh, B2C transitions, now uh, our aim is to provide uh, measurements as differential as possible, also in uh, uh, also for B two D star mu decays, for example, uh, in the context or uh, of uh, uh, left universality measurements, or just new physics searches, or um, trying a more precise determination of VCB, for example. Right, that sounds good. Um, I see a raised hand from from Danny. Um, do you want to ask your question, Danny? Thanks, Christine. Um, thanks, Lucia, for the nice talk and the, the good news about the uh, R lambda C uh, plus measurement. Um, staying with the baryonic uh, decays, um, so going in the same direction as, as, as Christine's uh, question, um, is there a prospect for having a lambda B to proton mu nu in a differential way, but basically as a, as a PDF uh, measurement of the of the decay distribution, since the combination with um, bottom to charm decay poses some problems in the interpretation. Um, uh, so I, I, I would really like to have a lambda B to proton semi leptonic or semi muonic measurement uh, differential, but also not normalized to to the bottom to charm decay. So is there is there any prospect for that in the future in the near future? 
okay, that's uh, uh, thank you for mentioning this is this is a good idea. So um, I'm not aware of uh, uh, measurements ongoing, um, but uh, I, uh, can, I I can imagine uh, people to be interested in uh, in working on this again. So I cannot promise you, you know, a time scale or anything because indeed there are no on ongoing measurements that I'm aware of. But um, I could imagine people being interested uh, more and more in differential measurements now. So basically we should spread the word a little bit. Very good, I'll right. try to do that. Okay, thanks very much, uh, Lucia. And we should now move on to the next speaker who is um, Danny Van Dyke there. Do you want to start sharing your slides, Danny? And the talk is uh, on flavor anomalies from the theory side. Right. So I hope you can see both my screen and my mouse pointer. Um, yep, yep, we can, yes. Yeah. Very good. Okay, so let's start. Um, uh, so to begin with, this is not going to be a comprehensive discussion of all the flavor anomalies that there are, where flavor anomalies are, as usually defined, substantial tensions shy of five sigma individually. Um, what I'm aiming for is an overview of a, of a subjective selection of flavor anomalies. Off the menu is specifically G minus two muon. There will be talks by Mark Lancaster and Aida El Kadra following mine. Uh, I've also not considered the Kabiba anomaly here. And I'd like to provide an idea of the current status of and the complexity behind the theory side of the flavor anomalies, of understanding the flavor anomalies. And I'm going to concentrate on bottom to charm tau nu and bottom to strange mu mu, uh, and uh, the anomalies seen in the Baba LHB uh, analysis and which are consistent with the, with the Atlas Bell and CMS measurements in the B2S mu mu case. So after Lucia's nice overview and after, after uh, my talk, there will be more in-depth discussions Tuesday afternoon and Wednesday morning, and they're listed here by Guy, Sally, uh, Carla, and Florian. And um, let's get into the thick of it. So what's the framework that we're using uh, to understand these anomalies? And uh, the theory predictions which are necessary for the understanding require a, a quite an elaborate framework. It's a multi-scale problem that we're facing where you have on the one hand, the top and the, the W, then in some intermediate scale, uh, the bottom quark, and then uh, some hadronic scale. And the usual divide and conquer approach works here. You introduce uh, an effective theory, a weak effective theory, abbreviated WET, which separates the high scales, top and W, from the low energy scales, bottom and uh, lambda hadronic. And then you use a renormalization group equation to understand how the wet behaves at a low scale. Um, using the wet means that it simplifies the computations. It simplifies the hadronic matrix elements that are necessary to describe these processes. And they can then be computed at the low scale of MB. And uh, ideally, uh, we take these from that QCD analysis um, where this is possible. Um, if this is not, not possible, we can use uh, tricks like a power expansion in lambda hadronic over uh, MB uh, using uh, effective, further effective theories like heavy quark effective theory and or soft collinear effective theory. This gives us ratios of hadronic matrix elements. And finally, the accuracy sum rules, the so-called schiffmann weinstein zakharov sum rules, and more importantly for the semi-leptonic decays, light cone QCD sum rules or LCSRs. So where does this weak effective theory come from? It's, as I try to describe, a low energy description of the standard model, definitely, but it can also encode um, possible BSM models. Um, there's a caveat here. This works only under the weak assumption that whatever BSM physics enters the, the uh, describes nature lives at or above the electroweak scale. So the first step here is to remove the W and the top and the Z fields, respectively, for the semileptonic charge current and semileptonic neutral current decays. You then introduce dimension six effective operators. Um, this suffices here because dimension eight operators, the next one in the uh, in the expansion, are suppressed naively by powers of MB squared over MW squared, so they pro uh, provide a 0.4% uh, correction. And in the end, you have an effective uh, Lagrangian, which uh, includes these uh, local B2 charm 
or Beta strange uh, um, currents as well as electronic currents. And uh, they are multiplied, these operators are multiplied by uh, Wilson coefficients or wet coefficients uh, that encode the high energy behavior. And uh, in the standard model, these can be computed, of course. And for, uh, a for an arbitrary BSM model, these can be inferred from data and compared with uh, the BSM model expressions for these coefficients. Okay, uh, let's split the discussion a little bit. On the left-hand side, we have these charge current semi-leptonic operators. On the right-hand side, the neutral current ones. In both cases, you start with 10 operators a priori for these semi-leptonic uh, transitions. Um, the standard model case uh, for the charge current looks like this. This is the regular V minus A uh, times V minus A structure of the, of the weak interaction. For uh, the uh, neutral current part, uh, you need dominantly these operators O9 and O10, which correspond in both cases to a V minus A hadronic current and a uh, vector or axial vector leptonic current. In the case of the charge current uh, processes, the whole uh, exercise becomes much easier because we can remove five of these operators if we assume that only left-handed neutrinos uh, contribute, which makes it very manageable in phenomenological and global fits of these Wilson coefficients. Uh, on the neutral current side, it becomes a little bit more difficult because the semi operators are not the only contributing operators. For consistent description at the level of the electromagnetic uh, fine structure constant, uh, what you need are four quark and radiative operators. So B2S photon, B2S gluon, or B2S QQ bar. All of them can contribute at this order to these processes. And particularly these four quark operators uh, are, well, they, uh, they are a problem and they're typically assumed to be standard model-like. And they are assumed such in all the phenomenological analyses that I show you uh, in the following. Right, but to probe BSM physics, even in the weak effective theory, we need accurate knowledge of the standard model contributions. So again, splitting this into charged and neutral currents, this is very different, a different situation. For the charged currents, we match already at the tree level. There's only one non-zero coefficient. I showed you the operator before, the V minus A times V minus A operator. There's no QCD involved, uh, sorry, QCD induced scale evolution and radiative corrections are under control since uh, the nineties. On the other hand, for the neutral current case, the matching starts at the one loop level only. There's a substantial QCD induced uh, scale dependence, which also mixes the Wilson coefficients as they evolve from the high scale to the B scale. Um, next to next to leading order accuracy matching has been performed already and partial next to next to leading logarithmic accuracy has been achieved in the evolutions and I've listed, um, um, I hope, all of the relevant papers uh, on, uh, on this matter. Right, with the understanding, with the knowledge of the standard model contributions at hand, we can go up about extracting now the Wilson coefficients, but we face another problem. So working dominantly to leading order in RFAE, uh, the matrix elements of the semi-leptonic operators factorize. However, they factorize into hadronic matrix elements of these hadronic currents. And uh, these are then discussed in terms of scalar-valued hadronic form factors. These hadronic form factors enter, uh, enter the amplitudes. They are a priori unknown. And without their knowledge, we cannot extract these Wilson coefficients, these red coefficients. So in both of these uh, semi-leptonic uh, decay cases, uh, we have so-called local form factors. So hadronic matrix elements or hadronic form factors of the local bottom to charm or bottom to strange mm -hmm. currents. Uh, the number of the independent form factors depends on what type and what variety of hadrons are involved. So for example, if you have a pseudoscalar decaying into another pseudoscalar, three form factors suffice. This is, for example, the case B bar to D tau nu or B to K mu plus mu minus. This becomes a lot more interesting and a lot more difficult if you include a vector state in the final state. Now you have seven independent form factors. This involves the D star and the K star final states. And if you go to the baryonic processes, you now have at least 10 of these form factors. In addition to this, if you discuss the neutral uh, current decays, 
the fork work operators produce a non-local contribution that pollutes the local B2S menu interaction. And the dominant contribution here comes from intermediate on-shell vector CC bar states. How do you have to imagine this? If this is your B meson that decays into a, a strange meson, then this red, uh, red square here corresponds to the insertion of the four quark operator. You produce a quark anti quark pair that annihilates via the electromagnetic current and then produces the lepton anti lepton uh, um, state. And all of this below here, below uh, the propagating photon, this enters your hydronic matrix elements, and this has cuts in the variable corresponding to this momentum squared. So at this point, I'd like to separate the discussion between charged and neutral current a little bit further. Let's begin with the charged current decays, specifically semitonic. You've seen this uh, plot by the h -Flav group uh, previously in Lucia's talk. Uh, what I'd like to discuss here very briefly is this works if you have only RD and RD star. Uh, as soon as you add further observables, let's say RDS and RDS star, Upsi or uh, uh, lambda c that we just heard about uh, uh, as, a, as a new measurement. Um, if you do this, this becomes a lot more complicated. And a discussion in terms of the Wilson coefficients is what you strive for. And as I said, to extract the Wilson coefficients from this data, what you require are the hydronic form factors. Now, in the case of bottom uh, specifically b bar to d and b bar to d star, the form factors are special. The heavy quark expansion is very effective if both quark flavors, the initial and the final state quark flavor in your transition are heavy. And a simultaneous expansion in alpha S up to next to leading order and lambda hadronic over MB and lambda hadronic over MC has been performed up to second power uh, in these papers already in the 1990s. This reveals relations between the form factors across, uh, I'm sorry, across both different currents, so vector, axial, vector, tensor, whatever, and processes, so B2D and B2D star. This reduces the number of independent form factor parameters quite a bit, and uh, it also allows us to relate uh, such form factors that only appear in, in BSM scenarios uh, to the standard model-like uh, matrix elements. Um, this is important because uh, in not, not in all of the cases we have lattice or light consumable results for these, uh, for example, tensor form factors. So uh, precise lattice QCD results for these pseudoscalar to pseudoscalar transitions uh, are available in large parts of the kinematic uh, phase space, both from the Fermilab milk and the HPQCD collaborations. And there are first lattice QCD results for the bottom to vector form factor uh, beyond uh, the, the so-called zero recoil points. So in, in more than one point of the phase space, again, both from HPQCD and Fermilab milk. And the nice thing is that there's a consistent picture of all of the theory inputs up to next to leading order in alpha s and uh, one over uh, m squared, uh, which does not yet include this updated um, uh, beta vector um, uh, data from the letters. So let's go to the interpretation. A global fit of these bottom to charm tau new data has been performed in this paper. Uh, measurements used here include RD and RD star, but also uh, the D star polarization in the semitonic decay. And it involves some assumptions. For example, that the taonic decay rate of the B sub C is smaller than X percent, where the authors used either 10 or 30%. Um, the semiotonic width therefore cannot dominate the, uh, the, the B sub C um, uh, total decay width, which was pointed out in this paper. And also another assumption is that no right-handed bottom to charm vector currents uh, exist, since these are lepton flavor universal as pointed out in this paper. As you can see on the right-hand side, uh, you get uh, more than uh, one solution. In fact, the authors found three solutions. Uh, these three solutions require further data to uh, distinguish, and um, uh, this is ongoing work. So what's next? Uh, well, I said it's ongoing work. These global fits need updating due to new measurements and predictions. Uh, RJ Psi to be included and uh, R Lambda C as well, as was pointed out uh, in this paper. This will test complementary uh, uh, wet constraints. Um, 
And uh, I have to take this out for uh, upcoming uh, uh, discussions now. Um, the uh, Bell 2 experiment is in an excellent position to contribute in the near future uh, along these lines. And a lot of work uh, has to be undertaken before LFU violation can be claimed in the sector. Uh, uh, the caveat is that the anomaly, uh, anomalies tend to vanish as we experienced uh, over time. And I would say that uh, on, for the charge current semiotronic decays, the situation is such that uh, the experiment has to has to deliver, and they are delivering, uh, because the theory is already under good control, uh, and we're looking forward to uh, updated uh, analyses here. Um, coming to the neutral current case, specifically bottom to charm uh, mu and antimuon. You've seen this uh, discussion a little bit uh, earlier in Lucia's talk. Let me let me uh, briefly summarize this. These are our X ratios, uh, B to X mu mu over B to X EE, specifically in the one to six GV square bin, where this refers to the invariant mass squared of the, of the dilepton pair. These lepton fever universality ratios as measured by LHCB uh, show a market deviation from the standard model prediction. Here is the difference between the LHCB measurement and the standard model prediction. Uh, the blue bars indicate the uncertainty of the theory prediction, while the black dots correspond to the measurements and their respective uncertainties. This has reached now uh, the three sigma level in individual tangents, like in RK. Um, and uh, this is going to be discussed further by Carla uh, uh, in the course of this conference. Um, beside these lepton flavor universality ratios, the anomalies are made up uh, of, uh, comprised of um, uh, problems with the branching ratios. Again, we take here the, uh, the LHB measurement and subtract the standard model prediction. You see that the theory uncertainties, again in blue, are much bigger now, relatively speaking. Um, and um, uh, nevertheless, you see a market uh, and uh, systematic uh, underfluctuation of the branching ratios across different decay modes, be it uh, uh, a neutral uh, vector final state, the phi as a final state, pseudoscalar, charged, uh, or neutral final states. Uh, the larger theory uncertainties here are, of course, a problem in the interpretation. And uh, finally, the angular distribution uh, in B2K pi mu mu, where P5 prime is usually taken as, uh, as uh, um, um, uh, the poster child, uh, where you can markedly see a deviation. Q square, again, is the dilepton mass squared. You see a distribution uh, in various bins of Q square in this observable. In black, you see the um, data points in orange, you see the standard model prediction and you see a market deviation in these two bins. Um, but this is not only in P5 prime where, where deviation exists, but the entire angular distribution with uh, 12 angular observables shows, um, uh, shows this, uh, this tension. It's just best illustrated in this observable P5 prime. Again, there are sizable uncertainties. Uh, they are not as big as in the branching ratio case, as we will see uh, in a bit. So these lepton flavor universality ratios, why is their uncertainty so small? Well, to leading order in alpha E, and um, uh, the, the standard model predictions differ from one only uh, due to phase space effects. Uh, so what you, what you find is that uh, uh, um, deviations from one are suppressed by four and mu squared over Q squared. And uh, the various groups that do these theory predictions, they agree on the predictions in the standard model. Um, the lepton flavor universality ratios can also be very sensitive to radiative electromagnetic uh, corrections. There's been a semi-analytic calculation of the integrated RK. This one agrees with the photospace simulation. I should have said RK and RK star. Uh, there's an update of this type of analysis using a double differential distribution in the case of RK star. Uh, here, the authors find that uh, there can be uh, large corrections uh, across the phase space. This requires more careful treatment. However, for integrated quantities, integrated over the angular phase space, current be best practices by the LHB experiment are compatible uh, with uh, what uh, uh, these authors uh, propose, and therefore the effects are much smaller and uh, under better control. There are no structure-dependent studies yet for these rare semi decays. 
But important insights can be gained from uh, QED factorization studies, which have been going on, for example, for B sub S to mu mu, and also for the non leptonic B to K pi decays. And this is an um, this is ongoing uh, work in a lot of groups. Five Coming minutes, to the branching Danny. ratios. Yeah, thank you. Coming to the branching ratios. Here we suffer from the um, from lack of cancellation uh, of the local form factors. Um, we also uh, are limited in the precision of the of the form factors because current lattice QCD results are limited to a Q square above roughly 12 GB square, which means that the theory predictions here are dominated by QCD like on some rule uncertainties, which are typically rather large. Um, sorry about that. Um, the um, uh, the first uh, paper to discuss in these QCD light consumer approaches the effect of having a finite width of the K star in the decay to chi pi has been discussed in, in 2019, which um, uh, increases the tension of the, uh, of the anomalies by increasing the rate um, uh, of the standard model prediction by roughly 20%. You can see how large these uncertainties is if this is compatible with previous uh, estimates. And I suggest you look into this paper, which is quite, quite interesting. In the angular observables now, the normalization of the hadronic form factors cancel. Uh, this makes theory correlations or understanding theory correlations indispensable. Otherwise, these cancellations will be incorrect. Um, a major task is now to disentangle the non-local contributions that I mentioned in the beginning from the wet coefficients C7 and C9. And these non-local uh, effects um, arise because currently we use uh, the difficulties with these non-local effects arise because we're using currently perturbative QCD at a time-like momentum transfer below the now Chamonix resonance. A posteriori, uh, a posteriori, this seems to work. There are no indications that the non-local effects um, are driving the anomalies. Nevertheless, um, they pose the largest systematic uncertainty in the determination of the C9 wet coefficient. You've seen these, um, uh, these uh, analyses and these plots before. Uh, these are C9 uh, versus C10, these two Wilson coefficients uh, in a variety of uh, uh, forms and in a variety of analyses. Uh, what I'd like to point out and highlight is this plot on the right that also Lucia uh, uh, showed before. There's a stunning agreement if you look at the results of uh, four of the major fitting groups and considering a common subset of lepton flavor universality probing uh, observables and the B sub S to mu branching ratio. And there's scenario dependent tensions if you do this analysis that uh, reach five sigma for the all operator fits to all data and four sigma for uh, fits to the so-called clean subsets of the data. I'd like to highlight one thing, which is that um, uh, there uh, is a possibility that uh, lepton flavor non-universal uh, new physics, uh, which is shown here on the y-axis, uh, can be uh, supplemented by lepton flavor universal new physics, which is so shown on the x-axis. And um, this um, increases uh, the tension uh, a bit, uh, but on the other hand, it makes the inference of the uh, Wilson coefficients sensitive to the non-local uh, form factors. And again, an accurate interpretation uh, of, the, of the data requires knowledge of the non-local form factors. So what's next here? For the LFU observables, the standard model predictions are very clean. Relative correct distributions seem to be under control and we need updated um, experimental measurements. Uh, we need complementary measurements because so far we are dominated by LHUB results. So we're looking at Bell, Bell2, Atlas and CMS. For the non-LFU observables, um, well, an overwhelming number of the measurements are non-LFU observables, a large variety across Q square bins and across experiments. Um, here, branching ratios and the angular observables require further theory improvements to improve our understanding because we're currently limited by theory uh, in determining the fit significances. I'd like to highlight a new Danny. strategy. <clears throat> Thank you. A new strategy to, uh, to approach these fits where um, instead of using this perturbative QCD approach in the green and the time-like region, you calculate only in the, sorry, in the green, the space-like region, you instead calculate in the time-like region, so at negative uh, momentum transfer, you extrapolate using a parameterization into the green, into the space-like region, and you account for experimental measurements of the non-leptonic decays on these narrow Charmonium resonances shown here, uh, and the global fit 
fit based on this recent parameterization is in pre preparation. So let me come to my conclusion. Um, the, we have seen, or have discussed uh, two of the uh, uh, B anomalies, um, bottom to charm, tau nu, and bottom to strange nu plus mu minus. Um, it seems that the beta charm tau nu anomalies uh, are, are stable. Um, uh, the, uh, the this updated or the, sorry this new LHGB uh, measurement of R lambda C uh, requires uh, some some careful consideration. Um, recent lattice analysis of the B2D and B2D star uh, form factors paved the road toward high precision theory only predictions of the lepton flavor universality ratios, and we're looking forward to complementary measurements by the LHG experiments and L2. The long-standing b 2 mu anomalies, of course, make us uh, hashtag cautiously excited. If you haven't followed that, that was quite interesting uh, in the course of the last year. Um, the significances uh, have been increasing with growing data sets. That's, that's, that uh, is, a, is a very good sign. Uh, the lepton flavor universality observables <clears throat> are currently limited by the experimental precision, but the non-LFE observables are limited by theory, and this is where we need to work. And here I'd like to point out again that the non-local form factors are currently the single largest systematic theory uncertainty. And with that, um, let me finish. Thank you much for, very much for your attention. And um, I'd like to answer questions if you have any. Great, Danny. Thanks very much for that great talk. Um, so questions, people should raise their hands. Um, I'll, I'll kick things off with a uh, sort of question on um, the B to K, U plus, U minus. You commented on need for more lattice QCD calculations there. Yeah. And we have now got a, uh, at least a preliminary set of uh, complete form factors covering the yes. full squared range this is from the HPQCD collaboration. Will Parrott will talk about that on Wednesday. I'm advertising his talk heavily here. Um, but I wanted to it's ask you, um, you know, how, how certain we are that we can um, isolate Q squared regions where we can really do a good comparison between theory and experiment without having to worry about these um, resonance contributions. I mean, at the very low Q squared, we, we do this cut at Q squared of one Jeb squared. So this bin is, is one Jeb squared to six Jeb squared. Um, you know, we really, is, is that, um, are you going to be able to shed light on that with this time-like analysis, for example, whether there is, an, you know, how much emission so the, there is in the very low Q squared region? I think this, the, this new strategy will be able to help to some extent. And the extent is, uh, is, is not yet clear to me. So um, um, basically, uh, what we will provide in the end, let me uh, go to one of the backup slides um, where I can illustrate this. Is, um, yeah, here we go. So this is a, this is a preliminary result from, from this type of analysis. Um, and uh, what you see here, um, are, um, let, let me take this, uh, these two plots. There's um, common to both plots is one parameter that describes these non-local form factors. Uh, one of many, while on the y-axis here, you have a parameter, um, a slope parameter in the B2K form factor for the tensor current, while here you have a, a one, uh, another parameter of one of these non-local form factors. As you can see, uh, the posterior that we obtain is, is very non-Gaussian, it's highly correlated, uh, which means that um, uh, from, my hope is, and this seems to indicate that this that this might work. Uh, the hope is that um, a global fit of the B2S mu nu uh, data will allow to not only extract um, the Wilson coefficients, but also relations between the local and the non-local uh, form factor parameters. And therefore, to some extent, we will be able to test uh, the uh, uh, the performance of the lattice QCD studies, uh, if you will. Does that answer your question? Uh, yes, no, thanks. Thanks. Uh, any other questions? We've got time for one quick question. Niels, would you like to ask your question? Uh, yeah, yeah, quick question. And many thanks, uh, Danny, for this excellent overview. I, I, I was just uh, wondering about what you said about the, um, the necessity to, uh, to do a full fit on the same leptonic uh, uh, anomalies also with R lambda C um, and, and not just look at the RD, RD star two dimensional plane. Um, so, so right. I, I was wondering what, what you showed on, on your slide nine, where you showed these, uh, 
uh, left-handed currents, the uh, global fit to the B2C uh, 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 data. So uh, j just a question, if, if you would include now this R lambda C, for example, would you then need to include more uh, uh, more Wilson coefficients or are, are these enough? Would you also, would you include, you know, this, uh, include this should degrees? suffice for the reason, um, um, right? The combination of, of two points, one point is, is this one at the bottom here. So the um, right-handed currents cannot explain lepton flavor non-universality in the charged currents, right? Uh, right-handed currents are uh, lepton flavor universal if you assume a SNEFT like scenario, so linear electric uh, uh, symmetry breaking uh, mechanism, um, you can add this right handed uh, uh, operator and this, the corresponding Wilson coefficient. But then, uh, if, if you see a, a non zero effect there, this is a clear sign that a, a, um, that a linear electric breaking uh, is not taking place and you need something more complicated. Um, this this is a heft like scenario, so Higgs effective theory rather than standard model effective theory. And um, then I mentioned that only five Wilson coefficients exist um, in total. Um, these five Wilson coefficients uh, are uh, there, or these five independent operators are there, because we assume um, only left-handed neutrinos. So you could at max get here ten independent uh, coefficients if you allow for right-handed neutrinos and nonlinear electric symmetry breaking. Um, so yeah, uh, it, it remains to be seen uh, that somebody actually does this analysis with the new data. Okay, I need to cut you off there. Thank Thanks you. very much, Danny. Um, Thank you. And we'll move on to the next talk. Um, Mark Lancaster, do you want to share your slides, Mark? Physics of Muons uh, Experimental Summary. Can you see that okay? Yes, that looks good. Great. Well, thanks, Christine, and thank you for the organizers for inviting me to this conference. I struggled to come up with a suitable picture to, de to depict how new world physics really fits into the overall landscape. And I ended up coming up with this, which I think portrays where we sit. We're certainly not one of the uh, big beasts in the, uh, in the landscape, but I think, we are capable of producing the odd surprise and, and scaring people, particularly uh, this year. So, of course, many of you will have seen the uh, publicity surrounding the muon G-2 result that came out in, in April. This has obviously produced a lot of interest, both in the media and, of course, from the theoretical community. We're already now at over a thousand citations citing this result of the Brookhaven result in, in the past year. This was couched in terms of almost the sort of last hope of experiments to find evidence for, for new physics. I think we've seen in the previous uh, talks that that's, that's, that's not the case. I think we're one of many experiments now which seem to be seeing uh, anomalies in the, in the flavor sector. But G minus two, of course, is not the only muon experiment. There are many experiments at all the major centers of particle physics in the world, particularly at PSI, Fermilab, and JPARC. I don't have time to talk about all of these experiments. Becky Chislett has a talk on Friday, and she will be talking about the muon initiatives, which are in the further future. I'll just be concentrating on these experiments in red, which have already begun taking data or which will start taking data in the next uh, next year or so. So the measurements that we are making experimentally typically fall into two classes. We're looking for deviations from a prediction, which is very precise in the standard model. That, of course, is the case for G minus two or in the case of lepton flavor universality, where the prediction is essentially one or we're looking for signals that are essentially zero in the standard model. A good example there is the electric dipole moment of the muon, which is basically zero in the standard model, or signs of charged lepton flavor violation, which similarly are essentially zero in the standard model. And the facilities to probe these two types of measurements require lots of muons. That's clearly one of the advantages of these experiments. There are DC beams typically at PSI, where the number of muons per second is about 10 to the eight. 
And then the other types of experiments used pulse beams at a sort of higher instantaneous muon rate of about 10 to the 10, and they're being deployed at Fermilab. And J-Park, the accelerator facilities for these are, are quite uh, sophisticated. For instance, at, at Fermilab, just to provide the, the muons, the muon G minus two requires four accelerators, a LINAC, a booster, a recycler ring, and a, and, a, and a delivery ring. So these are not small undertakings in, in terms of the accelerator infrastructure. So why are we use, using muons? Well, these accelerators can obviously produce these muons in large numbers. And fortunately, the lifetime of the muon is just long enough for us to do a precise Measurements, the fact, for instance, that we can produce of the order of 10 to the 10 muons per second in these pulsed experiments is highlighted here, the advantage in that respect. Here's a recent very nice result from Atlas searching for flavor violating Higgs decays to an electron and a muon. You see uh, no sign of, of, of an excess there and a limit at around 10 to the minus five. In contrast, if you look at what, for instance, mu 2 e and also Comet could do with their 10 to the 10 muons per second, you see that they can essentially probe this uh, flavor violating Yukawa couplings down to about 10 to the minus seven, which translates to a branching fraction of about 10 to the minus 10, so about five orders of magnitude, what is beyond with the direct uh, Higgs searches at the, at the, at the LHC. Similarly, Taos also should not be forgotten in, in this concept. The branching ratios that Taos are typically probing at the moment is around 10 to the minus eight, 10 to, 10 to the minus nine. And what you tend to see is in models of beyond the standard model physics is that you typically have to be, to have the same parameter, reach and parameter space as the muons, you typically need to be at branching fractions uh, below uh, 10, to, 10 to the minus nine, typically around 10 to the minus 12. However, I certainly don't want to give the impression that the tau measurements are not important. They're clearly extremely important. Many of these models predict enhancements in the third generations and the ratios of the muon measurements and the tau measurements are, are, very, are very important. The other principal reason for pursuing these measurements, particularly in the charge lepton flavor violation, is potentially you have access to high mass scales for the new physics and also a range of different models ranging from dipole loop type interactions to uh, contact interactions. That's particularly the case for the neutrinoless muon to electron conversion experiments shown by the blue lines and the muon to three electron experiments. The classic mu to e gamma experiment tends to be just sensitive to the dipole interactions. So it's clearly very important that measurements from all three of these different types of lepton flavor violation experiments are taken. If you see a signal in one and not in the other, it's probably telling you something about the type of interaction. The energy scales or mass scales probe in these experiments is pretty similar to what we've seen in, in, in the last few talks in the, in the quark section, again, comparable to the EDM experiments. So firstly, just talking about uh, the mu the muon G minus two measurements, you can see here on the plot on the right, some of the parameters which were mentioned in the first talk this morning about the precision electroweak measurements of the W mass and the top mass. And there was mention of the uh, mention of the Z mass. These are all measurements which are really taken at tens to hundreds, if not thousands of parts per million. So in the G minus two experiment, we're making measurements which are at the sub part per million level. In the case of the electron minus G minus two, it's much, 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 much better than that, of course. So before the recent Fermilab result, the situation was shown here on the left. There was a discrepancy with the standard model prediction at around 3.7 uh, uh, standard deviations. And you can see, and Aida will talk about this, I'm sure, in her talk following mine about the stability of the three predictions has been pretty good, at least from the uh, E plus E minus data sets and that culminated in this prediction shown here by the standard model 2020. And just to orientate you in terms of the sort of size of the data set, in this, in this measurement, the muon GMAS2 experiment was using about 10 billion uh, uh, muons. So this experiment is, in the scheme of things, relatively straightforward. Positive muons are injected into a circular storage ring with a magnetic field of about one and a half Tesla. 
these muons decay to positrons and they are detected a, uh, in 24 kilometers on the inside circumference of this ring, augmented by a couple of straw tracking detectors. What one sees, and due to the V minus A interaction, is that the spin of the highest energy positrons follows the spin direction of the original muon. If that wasn't the case, this measurement would not be possible. So essentially this measurement is just measuring the change in the population of the highest energy positrons as a function of time. And that oscillates with time at a certain well-defined frequency. And that well-defined frequency is just determined by the G minus two and the magnetic field. So if we can measure this frequency very precisely and the magnetic field precisely, we then have a measurement of, of G minus two. So in effect, there's an energy threshold placed in the analysis and the number of positrons above 1.7 GeV is counted as a function of time. And you can see data coming in here in, in real time that you see this characteristic rise and fall in the population of the positrons. Each of these rows here is about 100 microseconds, but you can see that in a matter of minutes, this characteristic rise and fall in the positron population is very apparent and it's got a very distinct frequency and you can fit that in six lines of code or so with a five five parameter fit and get a very crude determination of g minus two very quickly of course when you do that the fit is not particularly good it gives you a chi square per degree of freedom of about two and if you look at the fourier transform of the residuals of that particular fit you see distinct peaks at uh, different frequencies which correspond to the different frequencies of the simple harmonic motion of the beam and there's also a component due to the fact that not all the muons uh, are lost from the storage ring by decaying some of them hit collimators for instance and there's also instances of we have two low energy positrons which fake the signature of a single high energy high energy positron and of course these things have to be taken into a, into account and that adds a number of parameters to the fit they're all determined from the data itself not not simulation and you then repeat the fit and you get a very good fit it's 22 parameters you can see here the chi square degree of freedom of basically one and you see the absence of these frequencies which were present before so with the data that's been taken to date, the uncertainty in this fit is, 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 is basically all statistical. It's about 430 parts per billion. There are various corrections that need to be applied to the data. The largest one of these is accounting for the fact that the muons aren't all of the same momentum. There's a variance in the momentum of the muons of about 10 or 15 MeV or so, and we have to account for that. That changes the mean position of where the particles of the muons are in the ring, and we have to correct for that. The total systematic uncertainty was slightly larger than the experiment was trying to get to. It's 157 parts per billion compared to 100 parts per billion. The one thing that's worth noting here is that the deviation when combined with the Brookhaven experiment from the standard model is about two parts per million, which is about the same size as the electroweak contributions to G minus two. So it's actually a very large contribution in that respect. This is not, this is not a small deviation in terms of uh, if you're interpreting it in terms of a type of interaction, it's of the, as I said, it's of the size comparable to the electroweak interaction. It's worth looking at the contributions, the systematic uncertainties, about 80 effects were evaluated, five effects were the most significant, and all of those effects have been addressed in the data subsequent to this, this publication, particularly one of them was just due to uh, a failure in, in, in a couple of resistors in the quadrupole system. One of them was due to the fact that there were vibrations in the quadrupoles, which has now been fixed with uh, additional damping and more, more measurements. And so it's expected that the subsequent measurements from the experiment will achieve the, the systematic goal of the experiment of about 100 uh, parts per billion. So you can see here the two results, the, Bro the old Brookhaven result and the Fermilab result, they agree pretty well. And together they have a combined significance with respect to the prediction of 4.2 standard deviations. 
since that uh, data was analyzed, this is this data highlighted by this uh, yellow shading, this so-called run one data set. The experiment has taken a lot more data. It's still taking data at the moment and will take data for one more year. It's already got about 15 times the data set that was in this, uh, in this first publication. And the analysis is now proceeding and analyzing this data here, which is marked as run two and run three. Together, they should have a statistical uncertainty about a factor of two smaller than the first publication and with the systematic uncertainty also reduced from this 160 down to around 100. So the overall uncertainty in the next publication is likely to be about a factor of two better than the current uncertainty and will then be further reduced by about another 100 parts per billion with, with the final, final data sets. So one important thing, Aida will talk about the, the standard model prediction in much more detail, but I'm going to just stick to experimental verifications. One important thing to verify the theory prediction is an independent measurement of what is known as the hadronic vacuum polarization contribution to G minus two. This is traditionally determined either by the lattice or by looking at E plus E minus annihilation cross sections, as you can see on this plot on the right, where you have these many resonances, which you, which you have to integrate over to determine this uh, hadronic vacuum polarization contribution. This is, so there are several groups doing this. There's, a, there's an established procedure to do this, which has been uh, done, over, uh, done over many years. However, there is, there is another way to uh, determine this hydronic vacuum polarization contribution experimentally, and that is to look at uh, space like scattering of muons on electrons where you don't have the complications of the resonances. And that cross section or the T dependence of that cross section is directly related to this hydronic vacuum polarization. Uh, number which is uh, which forms the basis of the standard model prediction. The the uh, phase space that this can measure is about ninety percent of that uh, uh, contribution to the hydronic vacuum polarization. It's quite a difficult experiment in the respect that it requires excellent uh, angular resolution to determine the kinematics and hence deploys a range of uh, very thin silicon very thin silicon sensors and this will take data. At, uh, at the CERN, using the CERN muon beam. The other way, what the other thing that enters the muon G minus two measurement are measurements from muonium, mu plus E minus bound state system spectroscopy, particularly in order to get to a G minus two value, the quant the, the ratio of the muon mass, the electron mass needs to be known. It's also possible for those experiments to determine the ratio of the muon and the proton magnetic moments. Recently, an interesting paper came out that if the precision of these experiments, which are determined these quantities, these are two experiments, one at uh, PSI and one at actually museum, I should put those at JPARC, can be improved by about a factor of two concurrent with improvements in the QED theory, then just from those measurements alone, irrespective of using a storage ring, you can, you can make a independent determination of of, of G minus two. So that's been now looked at quite carefully. You can see there in purple that the, the precision that they, they you, one could hopefully achieve compared to the current precision at, at the moment. So these two experiments have uh, begun taking data. They've had a engineering runs. The museum experiment here at, at J Park is using an important beam line, the H beam line, which will begin producing uh, muons uh, at the, uh, now, basically, and that will also be used by the muon, J Park muon G, G minus two experiment, also a charged lepsum flavor violation experiment there. And there's also the uh, mu mass experiment at PSI also beginning to take data in 2022. So if you go to Wikipedia, it lists lots of anomalies in physics. There is another muon anomaly, which has been around for a number of years, in addition to the muon G minus two measurement, which is called the proton radius anomaly. And particularly what is the charge radius of the proton? Up until about 10 years ago, this was basically determined from spectroscopic measurements of electronic hydrogen or EP scattering uh, experiments. And you can see here in this yellow shaded region, this is the situation sort of 10 years ago that these black points were the electron proton scattering determination of the 
a proton charge radius. And then there was this spectroscopic muonium measurement in red with fantastic precision, which differed remarkably from these measurements by around seven or eight standard deviations. Since that time, there's been some movement. There's been some other measurements, particularly a measurement in 2019 at JLab of an electron proton scattering at low Q squared. And there has been uh, atomic hydrogen spectroscopy measurements. And these have tended to move back towards the muon determination of the, the charge radius, but there certainly remains issues in the data and also in understanding why this, with this previous data in electron proton scattering has been giving different values than what, what looks like the newer measurements are giving. So this has motivated a new experiment at PSI called MUSE with the motivation there in a single experiment to measure both EP and mu P scattering in the low Q squared region such that there can be determinations of the charge radius from both electrons and muons in the same experiment. And you would hope there that many of the systematics cancel. The experiment is now largely assembled and the first data was taken recently and there'll be more taken this year and, and next year. So now concluding with charge lepton flavor violation, as I said in my introduction, the motivation for this is, is twofold. One, that it potentially has access to high energy scales. It's also the case that the only way that such interactions can occur in the standard model is by neutrino oscillations. These are, of course, are, this is heavily suppressed over the, over the uh, lifetime of, of, the, of the W. And so in the standard model, these rates are very, very low of order 10 to the minus 50. There are many theoretical models predicting charged lepton flavor violation. Many of them incorporate heavy right-handed neutrinos, which then necessarily gives you a connection to extensions to the Higgs sector, since these heavy right-handed neutrinos can decay to a lepton and a charged Higgs. And typically in these models of heavy right-handed neutrinos. The different experiments have sensitivities to different mass ranges. There are the direct searches at the, uh, at the LHC. There are dedicated light sterile neutrino searches and the muon charge lepton flavor violation experiments tend to sit in another, in a, in a slightly higher mass region, which then gives a uh, good coverage across this uh, parameter space in terms of the, in this particular, in this particular models. Five minutes, Mark. Okay, so here is the history of these various charged lepton flavor violation measurements. The first ones were made, made uh, in, in the late 1940s at Chalk River and also at Liverpool. And you see this incredible progress in terms of how these have evolved over the years. And you also see that the, the tau measurements are at somewhat higher branching ratios, as I said, compared to the muons, there are these experiments looking at mu 2 e gamma, the mega experiment, mu to 3 e experiments, and three experiments which are going to be looking at the neutrinoless conversion of the electron of the muon to an electron in the field of the nucleus, d me, comet, and mu 2 e. And we're expecting considerable uh, progress of order of 10 to the 4 in the branching ratios in the next few years. The first one of these experiments, which is going to start, which is now taking data, is, is MEG2. They published their last result in 2000, from 2013 data in 2016 with a branching ratio of about 10 to the minus 13. And this basically reached the, the limits of this experiment because it's driven by the experimental resolutions in terms of the energy and the angle and the timing. So they basically had to completely overhaul their detector over the past five years. It's been an amazing achievement to improve the to improve the resolution such that they can extend the reach of the experiment by about a factor of 10. You see here that they've replaced all the inner PMTs with silicon PMTs with much, much better granularity and much, much better resolution. Here you see a comparison of the resolutions of the original mega experiment and the upgraded experiments. All these resolutions have now been verified in various engineering runs and you can see how the sensitivity improves over the coming years and the data taking is just starting now. There's also another interesting measurements that the MEG experiment can make. There's been a couple of observations of uh, the excited states of beryllium and helium 
having a resonance in the E plus E minus or a peak in E plus E minus spectrum at a certain angle. And it's possible for MEG to actually make that measurement if they install a lithium oxide target in the PSI proton beam. And they will actually have a resolution which is better than the, these previous observations by the Tomkey experiment. Simulations are shown here, which show that a mass resolution can be achieved for about half an MeV. So this data is, is will be taken in the first uh, month or so uh, of 2022, prior to their move to the uh, charged lepton flavor violation. So the final experiment I'd like to talk about, which is going to come online uh, next year, is the DME experiment. This is a this is a precursor to the comet and the MUTUE experiment, searching for the neutrinoless conversion of a muon to an electron. As I said, it uses uses a pulse beam at J Park in this H minus uh, uh, beam line. It is expecting to improve on the sensitivity by about a factor of 10, and then with a new silicon carbide target by about a factor of 100. They've already got a spectrum of the uh, muon decays in, in, in orbit, which is blinded in the region, which is of interest, which is actually the 105 MeV. It's a relatively simple experiment compared to Comet and, and mu to e based on a, a MWPCs and a very large magnet that they got called Pac-Man from Triumph, which momentum selects the, uh, the signal uh, electrons, which would be at 105 MeV. So that is going to begin running uh, this year. So to conclude, I think it's been a very interesting time for muons, both uh, this year and in the coming years. We, there is strengthened evidence for a deviation from the standard model in the muon G-2. This measurement has, has just, has, has, from its first tranche of data, will be uh, augmented with a data set at least 10 times uh, 10 times larger than this publication with more data to come. There's much more work being undertaken on the standard model prediction, which you will hear about in the next talk. And there's a whole suite of muon experiments coming online uh, in the next year and in the subsequent years. The ones in blue you will hear about from Becky on Friday. And there's also two uh, parallel talks tomorrow, one on the mu e experiment and one on this uh, upgraded MEG experiment. Thank you. Great, Mark. Thanks very much for that uh, comprehensive coverage of all, all things muon. Uh, if you want to ask a question, please raise your hands. Not singing hat. So let me just kick off. Uh, well, I'll give other people a chance to come up or to formulate their question. Um, what is the status of, of muon E? I, I don't think you said, or I missed it. Are they actually taking data yet? Or no, they're not taking data. They're at the moment. They're they're testing various different detector prototypes and things in in test beams at CERN in order to set up the experiment. They probably won't take data for another couple of years. But they've, so they've done various a, test beam well, runs in order to try and prove that they can get the resolution that they need. Right. I mean, you're setting some kind of deadline for them to get numbers ahead of you, presumably, um, the, ahead of muon G minus two. Well, I mean, muon G minus two, of course, will have uh, probably two more publications. We're expecting a publication probably on the time scale of about a year from now for this run two and run three, and then the next publication will be after we've taken all the data. So you can imagine that will take longer. So I think the muon E result will probably come in between those two G minus two publications. Right, right. Um, another quick question from me. Um, you're doing all of this with anti-muons, right? At the moment, is there yes. any plan at all to do muons or is that? Yeah, no, there is. There is, at the moment, there is a plan that when we can, we're, ta we're taking data at the moment until uh, June, July, and then the plan is that we will switch the complex over to produce negative muons, and we'll run for negative muons for a year. There are some challenges so there. There are some challenges there, which we need to evaluate over the summer. But the, yeah, the anticipation is that we will run next year with, with yeah, negative muons. So your accuracy for negative muons won't won't be anything like as good, presumably. No, no. So we're we're, a, we're aiming to to have a measurement which is uh, which is better than the Brookhaven measurement. But yes, the cross section, of course, is about forty percent that of the mu plus. So we will probably have a data set which is a comparable precision to the publication that we've just had, if not a little bit a, a little bit better. Right. Right. 
Um, quick last question from, from somebody else. I'm not seeing any hands raised. Um, no? Okay, thanks very much then, Mark. That was, oh, that was thank great you. to hear the progress there. And um, we'll move on to our final talk of this session, uh, which is Aida El Kadra talking about uh, the theory side of physics of muons. So, do you want to share your slides, Aida? Yes, thank you. Let me set this up real quick. Okay, um, can you see my slides? Yes, that all looks fine. Good, thank you. So you can see that I can, yeah. Okay, uh, thank you very much uh, for the invitation to give this talk. Uh, so my talk will be focused a little bit more on mu on G minus two than Mark's talk. And uh, on the theory side, I will also be focused on standard model theory. I um, think that's what uh, people would like to hear about. Uh, so just as a very brief reminder for the muon G minus two, uh, we are um, measuring essentially this vertex and measuring the quantum effects where all standard model particles contribute and there's a possibility for uh, sensitivity to uh, new particles as well. Um, Mark already gave a very nice uh, description of the experiment and the fantastic result, the Fermilab muon G minus two experiment and the fantastic result that came out earlier this year and the prospects for the future. So I certainly won't dwell on it. What I will tell you about a little bit more is the standard model uh, evaluation of this quantity. And uh, so some six or so years ago, uh, we formed the muon G minus two theory initiative uh, precisely to uh, support the experimental efforts and uh, reduce and quantify the theoretical uncertainties in particular on the hadronic corrections so that we would have uh, a clean and uh, precise also theoretical predictions in order to compare with the exquisite experimental precision that is clearly coming online. So for that purpose, we organized quite a few workshops. Our um, last year and the year before workshops were virtual uh, for obvious reasons, but we hope to have an in-person workshop uh, later this year in September uh, in uh, Edinburgh at the Higgs Center. Uh, so if you're interested in this, you might mark the dates. So the white paper from the theory initiative came out uh, in 2020, a few months before the experiment uh, announced their first result. And we started discussions about updating the white paper at our virtual meeting at the KEK in June and you know, expect to uh, develop more concrete plans at the next workshop. The muon G minus two theory initiative, uh, the breadth and diversity is reflected by the steering committee shown here. And there's also a link to the website. Uh, so let me now get to the um, standard model theory. All standard model particles contribute, and so the anomalous magnetic moment receives contributions from QED, electroweak interactions, and the hadronic corrections. Uh, so the QED contributions have been calculated to five loops, and the theoretical uncertainty is uh, incredibly small and essentially irrelevant uh, as a result. Uh, similarly, for the electroweak corrections, they've been computed completely through two-loop order, again, with the corresponding uncertainty 
that due to unknown higher order corrections and also some hadronic loops, that is much smaller than the experimental targets. So the theoretical uncertainty in the standard model is entirely determined by how well we know the hadronic corrections, the largest of which is the hadronic vacuum polarization, which starts at order alpha squared and is shown here by this diagram. There are higher order corrections to this at order alpha cubed and alpha to the four that are also taken into account. Uh, the entire thing is known to about 0.6%, so sub-percent precision, uh, which dominates the theory error as shown here. The hadronic light by light is uh, small because much smaller than hadronic vacuum polarization because it starts at alpha cubed. And one can also estimate the uh, next to leading correction for hadronic light by light scattering. Um, it is a significant contribution to the theory error despite how small it is um, currently at 20% because it is much, dif much more difficult to evaluate. And I'll tell you the status of both of these now. So the nice thing is that we have two very different, completely independent strategies for evaluating the hadronic corrections. The uh, strategy that's been used for over 20 years uh, takes dispersion relations and then experimental measurements of hadronic cross sections, which have been going on for more than 20 years, ever more precisely, and then taking the experimental measurements of E plus E minus cross sections to hadrons at low energies and adding all of those up can give a very precise a determination of the hadronic vacuum polarization. And as I'll show, there's also a new dispersive approach that's been developed for the hadronic light by light. For uh, the other completely independent approach is using a Euclidean lattice QCD, uh, which comes with a series of approximations in order to perform the calculation at all and perform it on a uh, computer then using Monte Carlo methods. Uh, in principle, this allows for an ab initio evaluation of the QCD effects and also attractively allows for basically an entire standard model theory based evaluation. Uh, it requires obviously large scale computational resources. Uh, and what I also want to point out is that lattice QCD has been used for uh, quite a few simple hadronic quantities in you know, famously in B physics, K on physics, uh, et cetera, uh, where results have been obtained already with sub percent precision. Uh, so coming back to the hadronic vacuum polarization and the dispersive evaluation, the uh, hadronic vacuum polarization function when plugged into the uh, into the loop integral can then be evaluated as this integral where we then take the uh, cross-section measurements here with a known integration kernel. This factor of one over S means that the integral is dominated by contributions from low energies, which means that the pi plus pi minus channel uh, is the dominant contribution here, about 73% of the total. Um, what uh, we are using nowadays, or what people are using nowadays as a model independent way to evaluate in this approach, the hadronic vacuum polarization is the so-called direct integration method, uh, which is feasible now because basically all of the channels that contribute have been measured. So that's a large campaign uh, by many different experiments. The Babar experiment, uh, even in recent years, has provided uh, some of the missing channels as well as the other experiments. And so now we have a complete account of the cross sections, all the channels in this low energy regime, uh, where at some point uh, below 2 GeV or so, one can make contact with perturbative QCD. Uh, this picture is a compilation by KNT a very colorful one that shows the contributions from the individual channels, which are shown in a big table by the DHMZ compilation. Now, the other thing that has re received a lot of attention is that in the PyPy channel, 
uh, in the intermediate energy regime there, there is a tension between the two experiments that are currently have the smallest error, the Babar experiment and the Chloe experiment. And uh, so this meant that um, having a conservative estimate of the associated uncertainty was very important and a lot of effort within the mu and g minus two theory and a lot of discussion went into developing a procedure that takes account of these tensions. There's also more recent developments um, in the course of the uh, Mion G minus theory uh, discussions um, in the workshops to uh, add analyticity and unitarity. So basically relating the cross section then to the pion form factor to further refine the two pion uh, contributions here. So all of this then um, was put together in the 2020 white paper um, using this conservative merging procedure to account for the tensions between the data sets, account for differences in the methodologies for compilation of the experimental input, how the systematic errors are interpreted, and also include these cross checks from unitarity and analyticity. Um, and uh, the full next to leading order radiative corrections are included. So here's another uh, recent uh, compilation um, of the uh, tension between uh, the different experiments and the new SND result uh, has been added here. There's a lot of ongoing work. Um, the experiments, many of the experiments are continuing to um, provide measurements in particular. The Babar experiment has a new analysis cooking uh, of a data set that is seven times larger than what went into their 2019 uh, paper in the PyPy channel. They also are looking at other channels. Uh, we can expect uh, the results of this analysis in, in a year or two or so. Then the Novosibirsk experiments are also providing new measurements, SND and CMD3, uh, and BEST3 is also expecting new results. And finally, the Bell2 experiment will have a R ratio measurement campaign. And uh, we all know that they will have very high statistics and will provide very important uh, measurements then of the low energy cross sections as well. Some of these experiments uh, that are performing new analyses are performing their analyses blind in order to have a unbiased uh, resolution to the tension. There's also been some recent uh, discussions and starting work on developing next to next to leading order Monte Carlo generators, uh, which will refine the radiative corrections in particular a little bit more and just consolidate the results. So let me now turn to lattice HVP uh, where the hadronic vacuum polarization is computed by computing a Euclidean correlation function with two electromagnetic currents inserted. And one can then rewrite the integral in Q squared of the, to obtain the hadronic vacuum polarization as an integral in Euclidean time and uh, with a known weight function. Uh, so again, this weight function will tend towards uh, low energies or um, will suppress the, um, the contributions here at uh, small Euclidean times. But uh, so this is well known Con uh, extraction now and pretty much all of the different lattice groups are using a, a form similar to this. So when using this uh, on the lattice, uh, when computing a mu on the lattice, the computation um, proceeds along somewhat different lines than on, in the experimental uh, data-driven evaluations where we sum over, as I showed, hadronic channels. Here we sum over the different flavor contributions and also the different contractions, connected and disconnected. Where disconnected always means that there is um, gluons uh, connecting the lines, just not quark lines. Uh, in, lattice, in the lattice calculations, we then also need to add QED and strong isospin breaking corrections in order to address the precision needs. And uh, this has been done. Uh, here's a summary of what went into the white paper. 
um, is just to show that the light quark connected contribution is the dominant contribution. It uh, makes up about 90% of the total. So if we want to have a sub percent uh, calculation of the hadronic uh, vacuum polarization on the lattice, we need to compute the light quark connected contribution at less than 90, at less than uh, 1%, obviously. So that drives the total uncertainty. But the subleading contributions must also be computed with sufficient accuracy so that they do not uh, affect the uh, uncertainty budget as large as they currently do in these um, in the determinations that went into the white paper. Uh, so here's the current uh, situation, the comparison of the um, AMU uh, evaluations. Uh, where I have taken um, all of the known standard model contributions, QED week and light by light from, from the white paper, and then substitute for the leading order hadronic vacuum polarization, the various evaluations. And you see the evaluations that went into the white paper. Those are the data-driven dispersive results and the, uh, the lattice results that have still very large errors except for the BMW result, which came out in 2020 and was published in 2021. So obviously uh, is not in the white paper, uh, is not in this average and is famously, as Mark already uh, talked about, is famously right in the middle between the experimental average and the dispersive results. Uh, so I can say a little bit more about the BMW result uh, uh, later, but um, uh, for now, I just wanted to point out that this calculation is a complete calculation. It does include all of the subleading corrections and also provides a very precise computation of the light quark connected contribution. And that's how they achieve this sub percent, 0.8 percent precision. Um, however, it is in tension with the data-driven HVP at about two sigma. So here's the result from the BMW, uh, sorry, here's the result from the um, white paper with a rather large error and the, uh, and, and the tension between the BMW result and the uh, hadronic vac and the data-driven result is shown here at two sigma. Another um, important feature is that there are further tensions for something called the intermediate window, uh, which I'll explain in a second, where the BMW result uh, exhibits a close to four sigma tension with data-driven evaluations that can also be, uh, the data-driven methods can also be used to evaluate this intermediate window and where it also reveals tensions between existing lattice calculations. This intermediate window is a very clever idea that was um, developed by the RBC collaboration. And it starts again with the fact that the hadronic vacuum polarization can be evaluated as an integral over Euclidean time. Then one can take a look at various regions in Euclidean time. And this in fact allows us to disentangle systematics and statistics from long distance finite volume and discretization effects. It turns out that there is this golden window, the intermediate window, where the most of the systematic corrections are small and where um, lattice calculations can proceed with small errors. So this is a focus now of many lattice groups to compute this intermediate window with precision. As you can see here, the existing, the precision by existing groups, by existing results, uh, is commensurate with the BMW precision, even though these results for the total AMU have much larger errors. This also allows internal consistency checks um, to really make sure that the systematic errors are very well understood by looking at the various windows separately and then in combination. And uh, that is um, ongoing work. Uh, so, looking at a focus on the windows on this intermediate window is, um, is something that both the RBC, the Fermilab and other lattice groups are um, planning to produce results very soon in 2022. And so we will have 
um, a lot more information about what the information, what the situation is, how consistent are different lattice results for this intermediate window. And um, in, in due course, we will then also have other lattice calculations with commensurate precision to the BMW uh, result in order to really scrutinize all of the different components and uh, the entire results by looking at the overall consistency between different lattice results. So in the meanwhile, in, for the muon G minus two theory initiative, we're developing a method average in order to um, first assess the quality criteria to include results and uh, have a detailed set of comparisons of sub quantities like windows and different contributions and a common prescription for separating QCD and QED here in order to be able to compare apples with apples. So um, this will be the method average for lattice HVP will be part of the white paper update that we're planning in, uh, in another year or so. Um, I, I'm also glad to report that most groups plan to include smaller lattice spacings to test the continuum extrapolation. Um, and this of course requires uh, continued access to adequate computational resources. Um, as Mark Five already minutes, pointed out, thank you. As Mark already pointed out, there are uh, connections between the evaluation of the hadronic vacuum polarization, obvious connections between it and E plus E minus goes to hadrons from the data-driven evaluation and also delta alpha hadrons. And you can't change one without affecting uh, the others. And um, in, in, uh, in the case of the BMW collaboration, uh, they have uh, hints that their result for the hadronic vacuum polarization, uh, which is larger than data-driven evaluations, is larger. Uh, the excess contributes to an ex uh, uh, corresponds to an excess at low energies. Uh, in which case the effect on delta alpha at MZ is very small, but then one has to deal with large differences in the hadronic cross-sections at low energies. So the entire situation needs to be understood better once we know whether or not lattice calculations as a whole are in agreement with data-driven evaluations or not. So that still needs to come. Let me now go very quickly to the hadronic light by light where it used to be that we could evaluate these contributions only in basically in models with some EFT uh, phrasing, uh, but now there is actually a dispersive approach available that provides a framework for data-driven evaluations more complicated and uh, than for the HVP but well underway, the dominant contributions are already very well quantified with sub-10% uh, sub uncertainty. And the sub-leading contributions are still the dominant source of uncertainty, but there's a lot of ongoing work to quantify them further. For uh, on the lattice side, there are two independent uh, computations of the hadronic light by light, completely independent using different methods which then provides an important cross check between the two approaches and they are completely consistent as shown here. So the uh, data-driven evaluation is shown here and the RBC collaborations evaluation that came out and was included, uh, came out before the white paper and was included in the white paper is shown here. And the new minds result, which was posted uh, just around the time of the Fermilab experiments announcement is completely consistent. So we can see that uh, this situation will only improve. So light by light is now very well determined. I wanted to show this uh, timeline. Uh, here's the timeline for the Fermilab experiment. The, um, the run five, I think is currently ongoing and then there will be on run six as well, and as Mark already said, there will be um, results uh, made available based on their analysis of runs two and three. And uh, the um, analysis campaign will probably go into 2025 or so. 
meanwhile, uh, on the theory side, we are um, providing uh, a white paper update, hopefully sometime in 2023. So there will continue to be an interplay between the timelines of the uh, theory initiative and the experiment. And we're also looking forward to the JPARC experiment coming online later. Two minutes, Saida. Thank you, I'm almost done. Uh, thank you, uh, Christine. Uh, here is a um, summary of lepton moments and Mark already talked about this as well. Uh, so in the middle is the, um, is a mu, the, the current situation between the standard model evaluation from the white paper and the new experimental average, the 4.2 sigma. And uh, for the tau lepton, I think there are some really nice ideas, but it would be great to have an experimental measurement uh, with precision that can resolve the, the theory, actually. Um, for the electron, it used to be that the um, measurement by, by the Harvard group and the uh, the standard model determination based on measurements of alpha were in very well, in very good agreement, but there are two recent measurements, relatively recent measurements, one from the Berkeley group and one from the Paris group of alpha, which then um, really heavily influences the standard model prediction for the electrons uh, anomalous magnetic moment. And you can see that these two measurements are actually different by five sigma and resulting in a tension that is either a positive two sigma, two and a half sigma or negative uh, close to two sigma. So this, this situation needs to be resolved, but it is interesting that there are already tensions also in the electron anomalous magnetic moment. So that will be an interesting place to watch. Here's my summary, which I've already uh, um, discussed earlier, the dispersive HVP, which currently forms the core of the standard model prediction, is comes in at 0.6% and will be improved. Lattice QCD calculations are coming online with sub percent uncertainty, and uh, but need to be better understood and better scrutinized. Uh, the light by light is in good shape now with two different approaches agreeing with one another. I should say that here for the light by light, we don't need sub percent precision, 10% precision would be completely fine for the purposes of uh, reducing the standard model error uh, to what we need. Uh, just um, a very quick thing is I just wanted to show you the, um, you know, the, there are many possibilities for BSM explanations. The difference is large, maybe surprisingly large. It's larger than the electroweak contribution. And um, this difference can be accommodated by many beyond the standard model scenarios uh, and provides constraints. And as Mark already pointed out, there are hundreds of papers that explore these possibilities. Uh, so this is a very interesting time indeed. And um, the muon G minus two is not the only anomaly as has been pointed out as well. So life is interesting, but it is the most significant anomaly at the moment. So here's my um, outlook. Um, basically stay tuned. Uh, the experiments will continue. The theory will continue. And I also wanted to make a plug for the muon E experiment, which um, will provide a space-like measurement of delta alpha that will be very interesting and a plug for the muon G minus two theory initiative. Thank you very much. Also thank you to our funding for the muon G minus two theory initiative and all the participants that I have here on this slide. Great, Aida. Thank you very much. Um, that was uh, good to get that theory update. Do we have any questions? People raise their hands. Not seeing any, let, let me just ask one to start things going. Um, are you expecting to resolve these uh, tensions in the window method 
by the next theory update? So some at some point during this this year. Um, so uh, I mean, we, that does seem the sort of biggest question hanging over. Right. The, right. So we, you and I, of course, are planning to um, to provide. A calculation of the intermediate window for the light port connected, and we're hoping to have a result very soon. The RBC and BMW, the RBC a UK QCD collaboration has also promised an update on the window. Um, other groups are following suit. So I think for the window, we should see updated results. And it will be very interesting to see if the updated results will. Res will consolidate and resolve the tensions or sharpen the tensions. I think we have to see that. And I think the same comments are, you know, are also true for the entire uh, AMU. Um, there will be new results coming along. All of the different compu components will be computed and we will see if, if the tensions are resolved or not. So if there are tensions, then in Let's the just move average. to another question, uh, Aida, shall we? I, I just sure. um, There are some hands up. So uh, okay. Tanya, would you like to ask your question? Yeah, thank you. Uh, honestly, it goes into the same direction. Um, I'm wondering about this soon. I mean, there are always the slides. I don't remember now the slide number where you have this um, BMW result and the other results. And uh, the statements I heard in the past is always that people are trying to you know, use the same methodology and uh, decrease the error bars and so on. So is there a timeline for this you can make statements about? Or... <clears throat> the the timeline for other lattice results, you mean? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, kind of get to this a year. Similar, similar. This year. Mm -hmm. This year. Okay. Okay, good. Um, Matteo, if you've got a quick question, do you want to just ask it? Yeah, yes, a quick question. So do I understand correctly that instead on the, on the side of the uh, data-driven uh, and muadronic from uh, the experiment. So the tension with, between uh, the CLO and Babar are irrelevant for the comparison between uh, G minus two measured value. Um, so the, the, the tension uh, is included in the, in, in the standard model evaluation. So it means that the error bar is larger let me just, let me uh, go to the slide. Oops. Here, so you can see it here. Um, this is the error from just the experimental measurements. You know, these are um, perturbative QCD, et cetera. And the tension between Babar and Chlori is just as big as the experimental uh, okay, so errors. And it is, so it is included. And it means, you know, if the tension didn't exist, then the central value, you know, is, is what it is. You know, th this would be uh, more than five sigma already. So this tension is the, is the reason why it's four sigma, not more than that. Okay. So okay, thank you. Great. Um, so thanks very much, Aida, and thank you to all the speakers for this afternoon. We've had a very interesting session. I'm now going to hand you back to Marco um, to remind you about the poster session, which comes next. Indeed. Uh, first, let me thank you, Christine, for, for chairing uh, so uh, efficiently and, and all, all the speakers as well for, for their uh, great talks. And yeah, I just want to uh, remind you again uh, of the of the poster session that is coming up, uh, a link to the PDF with all the links to, to all the posters and other material will uh, appear in the in a chat uh, imminently. And um, yeah, I hope you uh, find these uh, as interesting as, as these talks and, and we'll reconvene at half past five uh, for the next uh, plenary. OK, see you later.